Milos for the kind introduction. So I'll start off and Vincent will take over a bit later. Um, so when we were asked by the organizers a few weeks ago to uh, present a white, white paper, we were, well, uh, we were not sure what they expected. After all, it's not that usual that uh, a report that of a previous um, of, a, of a previous workshop is presented as a keynote at the conference. But then we thought maybe it is nice that at the beginning of a conference, uh, we take a bit this wider view, this more broader picture of the issues that concern us um, in lexicography before we delve into uh, specific papers, uh, specific research projects, uh, and the specific research questions. So I'm very happy to present to you, uh, Vincent and I are very happy to present to you the white paper that Frida Sturz, the director of the INT, Tomek Schornem, and uh, uh, Vincent and myself uh, wrote. Okay. Oh. Yes. Uh, we do want to dedicate this uh, keynote to our colleague Danica Schornheim, who died last summer uh, quite unexpectedly, unexpectedly, and who was one of the driving forces behind the workshop on the future of uh, academic lexicon. Um, overview of the talk, um, I'll first give a bit of background, how the white, cape, white paper came into existence, and then I'll uh, walk you through the main gist of the white paper, uh, the challenges that it discusses for the future of academic lexicography, challenges relating to the role and place of academic lexicography in society and science, the challenge of genericity versus specificity of lexicographic data, and then the scalability issue. And um, um, I'll end my part of the talk with some conclusions and recommendations that we <clears throat> formulated in the white paper. Then to make things a bit more interactive, there is a panel session where we invited three of the original speakers at the workshop uh, two years ago um, to uh, start a discussion on the conference topic of ELEX 2021, post-editing lexicography, and then we'll have a general discussion. Okay, so first, a bit of background how this white Well, um, in November 2019, we had a five-day workshop in Leiden, a workshop that was um, sponsored by the Netherlands, Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in, in Sciences and the Lorentz Center. It's a very nice format. It's competitive financing that you have to get to organize a workshop, but it's a very nice format. You get five days to invite a specialist from different domains to go really in depth uh, into a specific topic. Um, and so Frida Sturge and, and Tomek Schornheim of the Dutch Language Institute had the idea, why not have a workshop, one of these in-depth workshop, discussion workshops on the future of academic lexicography. Um, and there were a couple of other people um, uh, that also um, contributed to the conceiving of, of the workshop, Dirk Gerard from the University of Leuven, Isto Kozen, from Ljubljana University and then Lou Schiller and Marian Klamer from Leiden University. So, and it's out of this five day workshop that. Um, so, academic lexicography, what do we mean with that? Um, it's not necessarily uh, lexicography currently carried out in academia, it's more of a historic. Um, perspective, let's say. What we uh, consider ex academic lexicography is evidence-based evidence -based in the sense that it's based on the analysis of large amounts of language data, occurrences, of words, um, to, uh, to create lexico lexicographic content, and that it is underpinned by a theory of lexicography. Um, what ac academic lex lexicography tries to do is to compile concise but high quality knowledge about words. And it's to the benefit of the entire language community, 
and not uh, only a commercial purpose, which is not to say that some um, commercial dictionaries, of course, do meet the criteria that we sketch here for academic lexicography. Uh, I said it. I said it's a bit of a historic term because um, we started, or the, or the idea um, that we started from was a lexicography as it was developed uh, back in the 19th century for the first time. This um, em empirical uh, form of lexicography with these grand projects like, well, the the OED, the Deutsch, Deutsches Wörterbuch, or the Wörterbuch der Nederlandse Taal, so the, the Dutch dictionary. Um, Academic lexicography is also an early adopter, of, of, has been an early adopter of information technology and data processing techniques. Um, and we can all see that uh, we, conf at conferences like ELEX. But of course, early adopters we were, but the question we discussed in the workshop was, what does the future hold for this type of evidence-based lexicography? So the five-day discussion was centered around three main challenges. I already mentioned them in the overview, the role and place um, of academic lexicography in society, science and the knowledge economy, the scalability of both the analysis and the uh, lexicographic content production process, and then the accessibility and customization of lexicography. So we discussed five days about this, different presentations uh, by different speakers, uh, discussion sessions, and uh, what came out of those discussions was then written up in this white paper, um, the future of academic lexicography that you can uh, download from our website. Good. Um, what is a white paper? Maybe it's a strategic working document, specific issues related to the challenges. Um, presentation of uh, potential solutions and their feasibility, the types of expertise that you need from different disciplines to arrive at these solutions, and maybe a sketch of formats for collaboration um, between experts from different disciplines. So it's a working document. It's not brand new ideas sometimes, but it goes into it, it uh, goes into more detail about how uh, um, ideas about the future of lexicography can be implemented. That white paper was circulated in 2020 uh, among the former workshop participants and a bit wider, and we got feedback from them, from them, and that was then integrated in the second version of the white paper. Okay, so now we have a bit of background of how this white paper came into existence. Let me now go through, uh, well, the gist of what's in there. I can't discuss everything, so you can download and read the white paper for yourself, but I'll talk a bit about uh, the challenges that we discuss for the future of um, academic lexicography. Let me first talk about uh, this uh, first uh, challenge, challenge, the role and place of academic. Chris, Chris, can I stop you just for a second? Your audio is uh, rather bad, and we think it's due to your microphone. So maybe if you could switch to a headset, might improve things. Thank you. Is this better? Yeah, if you say something. So yeah, is this better now? I think so. Okay, good. Yeah, always also a challenge, not for the future of academic lexicography, maybe, but for um, online conferences. Good. Um, so this first challenge. Um, there a bit. Um, let's go back to this grand projects from the 19th century um, to see where academic lexicography started. Well, these projects, these grand dictionaries, they were mainly conceived by academics for academics, mainly philologists, as a sort of grand monuments to uh, the nation's heritage. So this 19th century romantic Of course, that developed from the 20th century and certainly in the 21st century, dictionaries are not uh, grand monuments anymore. Um, they are 
integral part of the digital linguistic infrastructure. They're not by academics, for academics, they serve the entire and very diverse language community. Language institutes that make dictionaries, like our own institute, they have become public data providers and central repositories for lexicographic data. And of course, that brings on uh, questions about what is the role of these language institutes in science and how do they get funded? And what is their role in society and how they to get funded? In the paper, um, you'll find more about how uh, lex academic lexicography is now situated on a nexus of multidisciplinary uh, cooperation, which disciplines are involved. And you'll also find something about um, the target groups um, um, that public policy wants language institutes uh, to address. But uh, what I'm going to talk about here is something is well, a challenge um, for the funding of institutes, this tension between um, the project-based funding and structural that language institutes and lexicographic institutes get. Um, what we talked about during the workshop was uh, project-based funding is of course necessary to build new infrastructure and develop new services. It's also the typical type of funding you get in academia, right? So two, three, four, some, sometimes a bit longer, four, five, six year projects, but they're limited in time. And of course, that does raise questions about post project um, sustainability of, um, of this linguistic and lexicographic uh, data creation. Um, and for that, um, you need structural funding for this post-project sustainability. Um, maintain and structural funding is needed to maintain infrastructure and services and guarantee continuity for users. Of course, that implies a long-term strategy and stable funding. And one of the things we discuss in the white paper is that this is still a difficult balance for many of the language institutes um, that were. Uh, of which we had representatives during the workshop, and that the role description of these institutes is often still in. An example from the INT, we recently also joined projects to uh, Vincent of sign language. That's certainly something we didn't do before, but you see it extends our role to um, other target groups uh, with uh, societal relevance. Um, there was also um, a conclusion or a recommendation uh, regarding this challenge that there is a need for a more permanent body and representation at the European level as a follow up um, of the time limited Alexis project that will end uh, next year. Why to structurally support joint cross disciplinary uh, research and development, lobby for lexicographic infrastructure for all languages um, and of course cooperation through further horizon europe uh, projects is nice but it's not a long-term structural uh, solution um, to safeguard um, um, the lexicographic in infrastructure of the 40 european languages and there was a suggestion that maybe there could be cooperation with the european federation of national institutes of language okay so first challenge in the white paper. Uh, the second challenge the, um, is about genericity versus specificity of lexicographic data. Um, traditional dictionary projects, they basically delivered a single end product with standalone content, so not really broader content meant to be used by themselves and for a specific user group. Uh, was intended. As we said before, language institutes have now become public data providers, um, not a single end product, but public lexicographic and linguistic data, um, not for a specific user group, but for very diverse end users and many usage scenarios. And it's not standalone content anymore. Lexicography is now linked infrastructure that is accessible to external parties for research and development. Now, uh, that brings on uh, quite some changes and challenges. 
Um, let's let's first look at the diverse end users. Um, Um, our societies, we all know, have become much more diverse. Language users have different linguistic backgrounds due to immigration or educational attainment levels, and they have different needs and expectations. Um, and of course, traditional ac academic lexicographic content is still quite hard to uh, customize to these specific user groups and specific user needs. So one of the questions we discussed is whether this is uh, feasible at all, or whether we should change um, from this project specific approach or so making uh, specific dictionaries for specific audiences, specific users, towards an approach that creates generic lexicographic databases that are then designed by, uh, that are by design customizable to specific groups. And um, that, of course, then you have to integrate data analytics uh, into um, your workflows to do user and usage modeling to an extent that we don't do now in lexicography. Um, and that is necessary for that semi-automatic customization. So you'll find a bit about that in uh, the white as well. The other side, um, uh, logically, if you uh, have a that the logical uh, consequence of that is um, that you are start to see lexicographic data as an infrastructure, right? Because you now have this generic database that then uh, is the basis, it's the infrastructure to develop other things, new structures, uh, so to speak. Um, so that brings new goals and practices to lexicography, not building a specific dictionary anymore, but building this database and infrastructure adaptable to specific use cases, useful for both human users, like traditional dictionaries were, but also for NLP uh, applications, and importantly, uh, open to external R&D um, players and integration into other application, applications. Um, of course, a lot of that is already uh, done by different projects, um, but um, this step of um, making lexicographic knowledge usable for different functions and different shapes that does require quite some rethinking in the lexicographic process and switch to a more modular approach um, where um, not everything is geared towards creating that one dictionary, but different modules can be created separately. Uh, Chris, sorry to interrupt. I'm one of the organizers. We still have issues with your sound. Can you please check that you that another piece of software is not running on your computer? Or can you maybe you have like S Skype or Slack or something that displays notifications and that might interfere with the microphone? Um, I'll have to go. I don't think so. The only thing running is um, Zoom itself. Okay. Uh, I can try to use another microphone still if you... Um... Because it sometimes go very, very quiet for like three, four seconds. And then it goes comes back to normal again, but it's di difficult to understand sometimes. Let me close some more applications, maybe. Maybe. And the only application running is Zoom and my uh, Adobe. I hope this helps. Yeah, it's it's happening even now. Maybe you can try to use another microphone. Okay, I'll uh, I'll try to switch to. Uh, yeah. 
Is this better? Well, we, we, we don't know. At the moment, it, it okay. is OK. Oh, OK, I'll try. Uh, good. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I wanted to give an example as well of this development to a more uh, central database, something that we've been developing for uh, an example from the INT as well, the Gigant lexicon, which is a computational lexicon for all of Dutch, basically. Uh, words and word groups that is accessible uh, to APIs and as a service. Um, but I wanted to finish off with this uh, challenge to, um, with some of the R&D challenges we uh, defined for having this generic yet customizable lexicographic infrastructure. Uh, we still need new lexicographic workflows for generic content creation. So, because lexicographers are not really used to uh, creating content, content without having a specific user group or usage in mind. And of course, workflows to then customize this generic content. Uh, we also need user modeling of these distributed and privacy protected users, distributed in the sense that they can be using our data through uh, intermediaries or other applications. So maybe there is a new role for crowdsourcing and citizen science there. And um, there is also still some R&D needed to link all this heterogeneous content that will come into existence if it's created in different customization projects for different uh, user groups. Is the audio now better? Yes, it seems much better. Okay, good. Um, so the final challenge that we discuss in uh, the in the white paper and that's closest to the conference theme of ELAX 2021 is scalability. Um, so far, e-lexicography you can say has focused on integrated shallow um, between brackets statistical corpus analyses into the lexicography lexicographer's tool set for easily identifying linguist, uh, sorry, relevant linguistic facts um, uh, for specific tasks like word sketches, um, good examples, these things, collocations. But it's clear that we're entering a new phase now where deep artificial intelligence will be integrated into the lexicographic workflow for data processing, but also for content creation in a way that it wasn't uh, before. Some of the techni technical things uh, we also discuss in the paper, but what I'm going to focus on here is uh, the new role that that implies for uh, the lexicographer. Okay. Um, let me say something first about the lexicographer's role in, in the introduction of uh, AI in the workflow. Um, first of all, uh, it's of course important to determine the bottlenecks in the current lexicographic workflow to know where the introduction of AI would have the most impact and be the most useful. The lexicographer can also be said the expert that is modeled and is to be modeled and emulated by the AI system. And of course, the AI system uh, needs input for that um, to emulate uh, the lexicographer expert. And uh, the input it ne will need is not just the end product, a dictionary article or the dictionary, but actually the whole content creation process. And um, we don't usually in lexicography record that much, uh, what is actually the work that is actually going in into producing uh, dictionary uh, content. So um, to train AIs, that process will need to be, will, uh, need to be made more explicit and more transparent. And finally, lexicographers will also be the users um, that will use this AI-enabled workflow later. So they also need to set the usability requirements uh, for that workflow. Um, something I'm not going into detail about that as well, something we also started at with at the INT um, after uh, the recommendations of the workshop and the white paper. Um, but once you have this AI uh, enabled workflow, what's the role of lexicographers in such an operational workflow? If some of the, uh, if partial automation, automation is possible, 
what we lexicographers do. And there we sketch in a white paper three potential role descriptions, one of quality assurance, one of augmented hybrid intelligence, and one of a manager mediator. Quality assurance, um, that's a more passive role for the lexicographer. There it's the AI that creates the content and the lexicographer supports and corrects uh, that AI by post-editing just like translators at the topic of uh, this conference, but maybe also by sample-based quality checks to, uh, to assure the overall quality, quality uh, of uh, the content. And maybe also by creating gold standard data for training and testing AIs. But all in all, a more, well, supportive passive role of the lexicographer. A second possible role is one um, where you have an augmented intelligence or sometimes called a hybrid intelligence, where you have a highly interactive integration of artificial intelligence and human expertise. The lexicographer would then initiate content creation and maybe the AI, AI can suggest uh, some, uh, um, an auto-completion of that content, just like you have um, to, uh, in the analogy with translation again, like you have in interactive translation. The AI could also present difficult cases to the human expert, like in an active learning uh, paradigm. And finally, the third role, one of manager and mediator. There, the lexicographer takes a high level role uh, overseeing the AI workflow, managing lexicographic projects, mediating between specific use cases that need to be um, where content needs to, needs to be created for and then the AI programming that's done by the IT department of the Institute, helping with the translation of lexicographic tasks into a technical solution, an AI solution, so requirement specifications, and managing maybe the crowdsourcing of any post editing, um, not doing the post editing themselves, but giving it further to uh, the crowd. Anyway, these uh, roles within an operational AI, these three roles are not mutually exclusive, of course, and we, they're still in flux. We don't know how it will work out. But we would, what we do know is that new skills are required for lexicographers, new skills in quality control of automated processes, interacting with AI systems, um, that's not that uh, easy or evident, um, managing and doing or contributing to the conceptual design of AI systems. Okay, so that's a bit the gist of uh, the things that we discuss in the white paper. There were also some conclusions and recommendations. Um, 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 but I think yeah, the switch to a reusable infrastructure, the new roles that lexicography has, and then the interaction between AI and NLP on the one hand, uh, and lexicography, uh, um, how they can benefit from each other. Uh, there were also more specific recommendations, but um, because of the time and the technical problems we had before, I, rec I suggest we um, you can read those in in the white paper itself. And the list, there are now some really urgent um, questions for clarification. I suggest we would go to uh, the panel session and see how uh, the things we discuss in the white paper links up to the, the topic of this conference, namely post-editing lexicography. Are there any urgent questions? There are no questions in the chat at the moment. So no okay. Questions. So um, then I yield the screen, I'll say, <laughs> to, um, to Vincent. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. So now it's my turn uh, to start playing the provocative role. Um, you still have the control of the slides, Chris, I guess. So can yeah. you maybe switch? So um, we decided to come up with um, to spice things up here at this conference uh, right from the morning uh, by giving you some uh, brave new world utopian or dystopian um, statements uh, so for for you to think about or to react on to and we've as Chris already said we've asked some uh, people here uh, 
to uh, prepare their reactions on these statements. So maybe we can go to the first uh, statement. So the first statement would be that the gradual replacement of lexicogra lexicographers by uh, artificial intelligence that would not only yeah, make the process of lexicography uh, more time and cost efficient, but it would also uh, improve uh, the quality by uh, first removing inconsistencies and secondly, by uh, allowing to, um, to use much more empirical data than would be possible uh, through uh, human eyes. And um, so we would like Annette, uh, Annette Closer to uh, react on, on this statement. Uh, so what do you think about this, Annette? Yes, hello. <clears throat> I hope you can all hear me and that there's no microphone problems on this side. Um, thank we, you for we you, hear you. You hear me. Perfect. Thank you for, for giving me that statement. Now I feel a bit but I may, maybe lack imagination and I'm full of skepticism and here is why. Can lexicographers be replaced? I think that there are still steps in the lexicographic process that can only be done by humans, um, by trained lexicographers at least, like subdivision of senses and so on. But I do think that intelligent software should support our work in this um, and it, it's already done that way. Does really artificial intelligence make the process more time and cost efficient? That's hard for me to answer. And I think maybe not, maybe yes, but maybe not, because the more automatically compiled data, the more time for proofing is needed. And you, you said that yourself, that quality is an important aspect of the question and one that dictionary users really expect at least at the moment, this might change, of course, in the future, but uh, the reliability of dictionary content, we should not neglect. And then if there is more and more data, we need more and more time to make sure that the data is correct. Yeah. So maybe you can go to the next slide, Chris. Um, you also said that um, it will help to remove inconsistencies. And I really thought about that point because I know that um, more than one lexicographer and even one lexicographer, lexicographer herself or himself will produce inconsistencies. But why is that? I think it's mainly due to the reason that the lexicon itself is not perfectly constructed and it's always changing. So there are inconsistencies in language and we have to try to, to catch those. And I don't know whether artificial intelligence will be able to adapt to the ever um, changing lexicon. But of course, intelligent programs should support lexicographers in writing hopefully consistent entries. And then you said, um, will the quality be improved by more and more empirical data? Do we need to expand the, um, the amount of data? And I think that's not necessarily so because any experienced lexicographer can very quickly disambiguate senses and so on based on a reasonably small number of corpus citations. If you have that trained view on the data, you can extract the relevant information even without looking at thousands of corpus citations. If artificial intelligence can be trained that way, then at some point, I guess maybe that's true what you said, but at the moment, at least I have a hard time to imagine that. And that's it. I hope you all have different opinions on this so that we can discuss. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, I think I agree partly with what you say, but I'm not a lexicographer, so that might be uh, one of the reasons. Um, is there anybody from, from the audience who would like to react on, on this topic? Oh, then you can just... I guess unmute yourself and uh, so if or well, maybe we all need to think about this uh, a bit longer and um, it might be well I would say something to discuss about uh, over the coffee break but that might be hard in these circumstances mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, okay we we have a, another uh, provocative statement for you to think about um, well, I, I, if or I can say yeah, something, sure. <laughs> uh, I do think if, if you look at, um, it's maybe less conspicuous uh, with modern dictionaries, but if you do look at 
for example, the, the VNT, so the big historic dictionary of Dutch, which was, of course, compiled over 150 years, you do, you do really recognize um, which lexicographer worked on which entries. Um, so in that sense, I do think um, that NAI could help to provide uh, more of a well, what, what templates used to do, um, but maybe AI can help um, to stick more to the template than many lexicographers did before and um, make, make the, uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the articles more consistent. So that, that's a different aspect of, of consistency than, than the lexicon itself. Yes, yes. Uh, But why, why do we need that kind of consistency? Why don't we expect um, a, a human user to be able, if he or she looks up one entry, to be completely satisfied with what is given in this entry. We usually have that view of comparing different entries, but uh, human users rarely do that when they want to look up information on one word. So why is it important that there is no noticeable trace of who wrote the entry? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, maybe you're right. But of course, the whole thing... Because because of the conference topic, one of the, the reasons that uh, you use machine translation and actually already translation memories before that was that kind of consistency that readers of text at least don't like, but maybe you're right, that's not the same for users of dictionaries. But as a user of, of a dictionary, I, I, I occasionally have like the case that I look up a word and I see it's I'm not very satisfied with the definition because it's like a, a definition which uh, which tells you to look up another word and then there it's it's returning to the original word and then these kind of things could I think reasonably easily be solved by AI but that's just one one type of inconsistency of course and there are uh, others that might be uh, useful for uh, or, or not not necessarily need to be removed um, i see a long comment in the in the chat but i cannot talk and read at the same time <laughs> so maybe if somebody sorry vincent react. can i say something yeah, sure. this is anna frankenberg um yeah um this is very interesting um speaking of inconsistency i think um one of the problems that is discussed a lot in translation studies uh the problem of removing inconsistency is that it also removes creativity and it re removes scope for new um, new ways of addressing lexicography because it's all based, machine learning is all based on what has already been done. So it removes the potential for creating new things and taking a step further maybe. And I, think, I think that's an ideal bridge to go to the to the next statement, right? Because that clearly yes. relates to what you uh, just said. Uh, okay. Oh no, I I skipped one. Uh, well, well, we'll do this one first, then, and then we'll go back to the. So um, yeah, comparing translation with uh, lexicography, we could. Uh, See that whereas translation is a linear uh, process that only applies linguistic knowledge to one data point at a time, lexicography is a synthetic uh, process that creates new high level linguistic knowledge um, out of many different data points. So post editing, post -editing in translation is not uh, directly comparable or um, yeah, it's not the same as, as, uh, as it would be in lexicography. Um, and so the real uh, one-click dictionary would be uh, impossible. Um, so uh, if Wojtek can uh, react to this statement. Yeah, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, well, I think the, the statement is partly right but also partly wrong which is uh, which is uh, say illustrated by uh, the fact that the world that we live in uh, all, already already sees positive post editing lexicography as we will see in many many of the papers uh, at at this conference i think that uh, the two descriptions of the statement are uh, a bit oversimplifying the real state uh, 
on one hand, uh, the translation process is really complex. We have seen a lot of research and and uh, uh, and also a lot of, lot of development effort put into into uh, computer aided translation tools and so on. So the process is not that not that simple as as the uh, as the description might uh, suggest. On the other hand, uh, lexicographic uh, process is definitely uh, complex, but it can be decomposed into uh, into uh, say isolated bricks that can be uh, that can be uh, solved separately, and they can be a good subject to to the uh, to the machine learning and and uh, and uh, artificial and intelligence intelligence tools. Of course, the process. Um, if if not always, it will it will uh, for a long time need uh, human su supervision because the tools are by no means perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, and the the point where I agree with the statement is that the the frameworks for uh, post editing lexicography and post editing translation need to be very different because the processes are are very different. So we need to. Uh, we need a different approach, maybe not into uh, in 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 the in the technology itself, but uh, but in the management process, in the data management process. I as I as I mentioned, the creating a lexicography entry is a process consisting of many bricks that uh, that need to be put together quite carefully, and I don't think we currently have a good process for that. And also, it 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 touches what what Chris said before uh, regarding the role of the of the lexicographer. We need to uh, we need to uh, rethink the the process and redefine the different roles that the, the lexicographers will take uh, in in this in this post editing lexicography world. Okay, um, but don't you think it would be uh... Of course, lots of research would still be needed, but some kind of automatic dictionary generation based on the existing amount of uh, definitions we already have. Uh, and um, yeah, and some new techniques gathering maybe the corpus data, which would allow us to, to cluster different senses uh, based on these uh, semantic vector representations. If you combine all that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I guess yeah. we're not there yet, <laughs> but uh, thinking about the future, um, don't you think there, yeah, something would be- Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree we are not there yet, but I think many of the of the tasks, uh, especially this sense division is, uh, is simpler than uh, many people think, <laughs> actually. Okay, anybody from? The audience who wants to react to this, um, let's see. There's quite some discussion on who costs more, a lexicographer or a, a programmer, <laughs> uh, which is an interesting discussion. Um, okay. But maybe um, we can leave that to... Uh, can I can leave. see Institute of the Dutch Language raised the hand. Please unmute yourself and you can ask your question if you want to react. That's an incognito reaction from somebody from our side. I okay, who's behind the... It's me, it's Catherine. I raised Hi, my... Catherine. So there's a couple of issues for me. It's, um, it's uh, only how you do you implement something in the workflow because all of this artificial intelligence... Uh, uh, um, uh, processing costs a lot of time uh, and uh, there's still a lot of environments need to needed to really implement it in, in the workflow and I'm wondering uh, whether um, if I remember my time from the lexicography from the <coughs> uh, whether these uh, mechanisms um, discover things that are new and not usual and infrequent, but still very interesting to describe. And if we use an artificial intelligence, I'm wondering whether we find things we would know as a lexicographer intuitively and that they confirm our intuitions and not give us the things that uh, need worth uh, paying attention to. That okay. was 
if, if, if I would make it a bit more provocative, what would be so specific human-like about lexicography that it would not be possible to be replaced by uh, artificial intelligence? I mean, people thought that uh, uh, about chess and about Go and about all these problems uh, were seen as, as highly intellectual, intelligent uh, um, yeah, behavior. Yeah, yeah. Maybe and that's food for thought uh, because we, we are in the last five minutes and if we want to have the, the final uh, reply statement. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's a bit connected uh, to that, of course. Uh, so what would be, um, yeah, would it be possible to, to leave the, 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 let's say the, the daily uh, uh, normal lexicographer's work to the, to the crowd? Um, so leave it up to the crowd to do post editing of, of um, many of the tasks or nearly of all tasks and then uh, have a, an overview or a management by a, a lexicographer would that be uh, a possible uh, future so leaving it up to the to the crowd to the uh, crowdsourcing environment so do you need uh, could it be done by human judgment on on low uh, well, low cognitive requirements let's say um, is uh, could we get a reaction from Mishtok? okay uh, yes thank you for this question <laughs> it's a very difficult one for a lexicographer to argue for um and i have a, i prepared a few slides if i can share the screen um actually i cannot so i can i think uh, maybe i can try now uh, just a second okay so i would like to turn the question uh, on its head basically and ask uh, we, we should ask ourselves whether it's actually possible that lexicography survives without crowdsourcing. Um, because if you go, um, if you look at how we treat crowdsources, we normally pose a dichotomy between an expert and a non-expert. But if we look in the uh, history of lexicography, um, crowdsources or users or public has always been involved in making dictionaries. I mean, Whenever we hear crowdsourcing now, we think, uh, you know, that's a new methodology. It's, um, we really need to think about it. But if you go through the history, you can see that it started in the 19th century. Nowadays, we are relying on people to provide us with uh, suggestions for new senses, new meanings. So um, to disappoint many lexicographers, this is, is already taking place on a daily basis. And we can, we can see that some publishers prefer to have more control. And in some cases, um, like Slovenian Thesaurus, where we use users to have to control other users' contributions. Now, um, if you go even further, you have to think about that there are many languages where there are even no lexicographers at hand. So you have to rely on people that know the language. And I welcome you actually to um, view the presentation by Gregor Anderson and Anna Luisa Dergnot, uh, who present their tool Etilex on living dictionaries. And you can see how many resource, how many um, languages are even without lex lexical resources and rely on crowdsourcers or community to make such resources. So. If we go back to this original um, question that was asked, I think that the crowdsourcing of, uh, of post-editing or even making of the dictionaries is already happening. It's no way, I mean, it's integral part of taxonomy just in different languages in, to different extents. And there are two variables that we should consider um, for the future. That one is that what is the level of automation that has been introduced in a process of making a particular dictionary? So some dictionaries uh, have more of that and some perhaps even none. And the second is, uh, it's a heavy task on lexicographers and everybody involved in uh, making of a dictionary is how innovative 
uh, we are and how able we are to come up with tasks for crowdsourcers. So that means knowing the shortcomings of automation processes, the short, the, the benefits of AI, and this is not, uh, uh, sometimes we don't know at all, basically. And uh, finally, to reply to the second part of the statement, where we bring in AI to customize lexicographic content. And this is where um, I basically have two replies to this. One is that it's not possible without knowing the user's needs. So user research is pivotal. And secondly, in these cases, lexicographers are more or less non-experts. As much as we hate to admit, in these cases, we need help of AI experts, of design experts, and so on. So I think it's um, there's the challenge here is for lexicographers not to um, basically not to st study the the, the uh, shortcomings of AI, but to think together with AI people of um, good solutions to make really e-dictionaries um, the best as they can be. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a, a very constructive uh, uh, ending of the uh, of this morning session before the uh, coffee break, I think. Uh, well, it's 10 o'clock, so I am afraid we don't have much time uh, left for for uh, more discussion in this session. But as I see uh, the, the chat messages scrolling by, there is a discussion going on. Um, so uh, I would suggest you keep this going for the next two days. And um, um, yeah, I think we can conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think this has been very, really, an excellent start of the day. Uh, thank you for such a thought-provoking talk. Uh, I can say that uh, it placed me exactly into the kind of mindset I would want uh, at the beginning of ELX. Uh, you've really touched uh, so many uh, so many issues relating to the uh, to the topic of post-living lexicography and, and academic lexicography. Uh, sadly, the one thing that we are not uh, really um, that, that, that is the same like in a normal in a conference is that we need to keep to the time. So um, I really invite everyone to continue the discussion on the on the chat. Um, we are going to have a break now for some say uh, ten minutes, and we start and reconvene again at uh, quarter past ten uh, with a panel session on multi-word expression, uh, which will be moderated by Carota Berrios. Uh, so once again, thank you very much. Enjoy a lot. Uh, and uh, I hope.